As we continue worshiping in setting 10 today, the gospel acclamation is the Alleluia found in the front section of your red hymnal on page 205. I invite you to arise as you're able. This is the Holy Gospel according to Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried on there from foot, on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat, when they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And whatever, wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Friends, grace and peace to you from God the Creator and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon title today is What Happens in Vegas. I haven't preached for about the last, well, for the last two weeks, and I was trying to remember when the last time was that there were two consecutive weeks without preaching, and I don't know that there ever has been. So I'm going to try to shake the rust out a little bit today and kind of hop back into the saddle and at least make a little bit of sense. But what happens in Vegas seemed like a really important title to me. I've had lots of time to ponder our texts, two full weeks to sit there and think about our texts and about preaching and miss how much I love being up here in front of you all. Mostly I didn't, <laughs> but sometimes I did. And my mind and my heart kept going back to Vegas. Not that I wasn't tempted to pull out an old Good Shepherd Sunday sermon and just kind of take a look at that, maybe reuse part of it, I don't know. But I didn't, I didn't. But I was tempted this week because very much the theme and the thread running through at least three of our scriptures is that image of shepherding and how Christ is the good shepherd. First we have Jeremiah railing against what he calls the, what God calls the bad shepherds in Jerusalem who have led the people astray and it's kind of this outlook to the exile that's coming, the exile to Babylon. And this week, instead of just reading Psalm 23, we got to sing it together. I love hymn 780, where we sing back and forth, shepherd me, O oh God, beyond my wants, beyond. It's beautiful. And so we can feel that kind of thread shaping the story today. Jesus, in the story about uh, him in the Gospels and his disciples, when they had reached the other side, he, he saw the people and said, they're like sheep without a shepherd. I guess that's how this all kind of ties together. So I believe that this would be just about like Good Shepherd Sunday. But Good Shepherd Sunday is the fourth Sunday of Easter, no exceptions. The lectionary is clear. So I didn't go back and use something from a previous Good Shepherd Sunday because I believe there must be another theme 
something perhaps even maybe more powerful, something that takes it even just a bit further than that image of Christ the shepherd and ties this all together, that gets it there but goes past it, doesn't stop there. After all, Jesus looked upon the people. He made that comment about being sheep without a shepherd. Why did he do that? Because he had compassion for them. He had compassion for them. And I believe that that word, that theme, that really ties it all together today is the theme of compassion. In the book of Ephesians, we hear it so beautifully today. Those who were far away have been brought near. Jesus had compassion upon the people. The 23rd Psalm is full of compassion. It's just termed as shepherding and sheep. Compassion's a wonderful theme and so desperately needed in our country and in our culture today, right? We don't find a whole lot of compassion out and about these days. And so that brings us back to Vegas because Vegas is all about compassion. <laughs> Not just receiving compassion, but giving compassion, right? Letting our gratitude become generosity in compassion. That's what Vegas is all about, isn't it? Oh, maybe I should be a little bit more clear. I'm talking about the Vegas nerve in our bodies. <laughs> what did you think I was talking about? Las Vegas, well, not much to say about Las Vegas. I suppose it has its good points to good shows and whatnot, but I would not say that it's all about compassion. But the Vegas nerve, can I get a quick show of hands? Who's heard of this before? Okay, yeah, you all are educated. The Vegas nerve is the largest nerve in our body. And recent studies show that it's really more about receiving and processing and then giving compassion than we might have ever thought before. We call it the autonomic nervous system. You see, there's all these bundles of nerves coming out of your spinal cord that affect things like blood flow, digestion, muscle, muscle contractions, glucose, and so forth. And the vagus, is, the vagus nerve is a big part of that system, the biggest one in fact. Like I said, the biggest nerve in our system. It's a mammalian bundle of nerves. It stretches from the top of your spinal cord and actually reaches into your amygdala, which now I know is right back here, and goes all the way down, or maybe it begins or maybe it ends in the amygdala, but it goes all the way down, weaving its way through your heart, through your lungs, through your digestive system, and it kind of winds up back up in your gut. It receives all this amazing information from the microbiome there and responds accordingly. It processes signals from your heart and from your lungs and helps you to react accordingly. And we just hadn't studied it that much until the last few decades. It's the kind of thing that is greatly affected by spirituality, by comfort, by compassion. What is shown to us in a young age is processed by the vagus nerve. It's almost like a muscle in that way. It can be trained in a certain way so as to respond to the world in a more compassionate way. And I think that's kind of amazing. Now, these days, after some study, it's being called the love organ. That sounds like kind of the rated R version to me, but it's also the caretaking organ, the social engagement organ. And Recently published research says that when we feel compassion and when we show compassion to others, it's the vagus nerve that is active. It opens you up to other people. It allows you to vocalize in a tender way. It allows you to look people in the eye. When we meditate, the vagus nerve is activated in a big way. And Dr. Dr. Keltner from UC Berkeley says awe activates the vagus nerve because it orients you to be open to the world and to other people in compassionate ways. And again, the vagus nerve can be nurtured and exercised early in our lives as we are shown love, compassion, kindness. And as we receive that and process it, the vagus nerve learns how to respond in kind. 
it grows and flourishes through our lives so that we practice not only taking in that kind of love and compassionate care, but also responding in the world in that way. It learns how to respond. As we learn to pay attention to our body's response to the things and people around us, and as we learn to respond to the needs of others, we can learn to do so in a compassionate way. And it's the vagus nerve that allows us to do that. It seems that what made, part of what made Jesus so very special is he seems to be able to tap deeply into his vagus nerve, even if you might not call it that. And he can react with compassion when the rest of the world seems crabby and exhausted. The word I might use in today's gospel would be hangry. Jesus and the disciples are hangry. There's people all over the place swarming them in a frenzy and they haven't even had time to eat. And Jesus says, come away with me. Come away, away from the crowds. By the time we reach Mark chapter six, Jesus and his followers have been out and about for quite a while now. He has sent them out to preach and teach and as they report back to him, they have a lot to report. And although that he's been asking people not to tell when he's healing people and doing these things, he typically in Mark says, don't tell anyone. Word has clearly gotten out. The disciples are doing their job and he is surrounded by a mob of people almost con constantly. Indeed, in this passage, there is an essence of frenzy as the people swarm around Jesus and the disciples. And he invites the disciples to come away and rest, but the, the crowds see them. There's a real community aspect to this. If anybody who's been to the Sea of Galilee knows, it's not that big. And so they take off in the boat and everybody goes, all right, it looks like they're going to Gennesaret. And they run around and they meet them there. And people from the towns and cities there flock out to meet Jesus and the disciples. You can almost hear the disciples grumbling as the people set upon them once again, just aching to be healed, aching to get a piece of the Messiah, a piece of his healing power and glory. But Jesus doesn't grumble. Instead, his bowels are moved. It's okay to laugh. His bowels are moved. And I should clarify, in the ancient world, the bowels or the gut were thought to be the seat of things like love, grace, compassion. And so literally in the original Greek, the text said that Je says that Jesus looked upon the people and was moved in his bowels. It means something just this much different these days. And his compassion is powerful, more than sympathy, more than pity, more than empathy even. And to be clear, while empathy is a wonderful thing and a really good starting point, it's not quite the same as compassion. It's not quite the same as moving your bowels. Empathy is important. If you are an empath by nature, keep it up. If you naturally feel the feelings of others, it can be hard. Sometimes it can even be unhealthy, so watch out for that. But if you naturally see things from other people's perspective and you feel their feelings right along with them, I think that's probably a good thing overall. If you're not naturally an empath, perhaps that would be a good spiritual exercise. Practice seeing things from someone else's perspective, getting into their shoes, into their life. Remember that word sonder from a couple weeks ago. Remember that every single person you ever see or meet has a life just as complex as yours. It makes it easier to feel their feelings. Maybe you can practice putting yourself in someone else's situation and wondering what feelings would I feel if I were in that situation? Doing these things might even lead us down uh, this kind of wonderful way of being in the world of saying, you know, even if they're jerks, people are doing the best they can in that moment. It's hard to do. That's why it's a spiritual practice. But compassion is not the same thing as empathy. Empathy always circles back to you, the way that you're feeling their feelings. How can you be changed in your 
treatment of someone because you can feel their feelings. But compassion, on the other hand, is validation, care, and nurture of another feelings simply because they are. Simply because you know that you are looking at and dealing with another human being, and so validating a person's feelings simply because they are. Even empathy winds up back with you. Compassion is all about the other. Jesus had compassion on the crowds. His heart poured out for them. His bowels were moved. And as much as we need empathy in our country right now, the ability to see someone else's perspective and feel their feelings, perhaps we need compassion even more. Perhaps we need to practice affirming and caring for the needs of others simply because they are. As your pastor, I would add, simply because they are a child of God. And you might not see eye to eye, and they might be very different from you, but they are a child of God. Because as cynical as we've all become, I think that we can agree that if we were practicing the compassion of Christ, for someone unlike us, then no one would ever point a gun at another human being and pull the trigger. Not one person would attack another person in the street for the sign that they're holding or the clothes that they're wearing. Social media trolls would disappear overnight. How amazing would that be? Turns out when these things happen, or even when we think something terrible about another person, no matter how vile we find them to be, we are actually working against our better nature. It all happens in Vegas. God built us this way. God made our biggest nerve to be the one that can both absorb, but then also practice compassion for other people, validating and caring for and nurturing the needs of another person simply because they are. The vagus nerve proves that we are actually hardwired for compassion. It is an amazing way that we are built, but we work against it so hard. So in the coming days, weeks, and months, may we remember that God has placed us here, has designed us to love and care for one another. May we remember that Christ had compassion on the whole flock, even amidst a frenzy of activity, a desperation from the masses. Jesus wasn't checking IDs or voter registration cards or uh, any other kind of checklists for people to touch his cloak and be healed. He had compassion upon them all. He saw them all as one flock together, and that's what we are, the whole human family. And may we not just absorb his love and grace and compassion, aided by Vegas. Let us remember that what happens in Vegas can't really stay in Vegas. Thanks be to God. Amen. Oh,